This is Wednesday, November 13th, 1996. Would like to open the meeting with the roll call by the manager, please. Clerk pro tem tonight. Clerk pro tem. Let's. Yes. yes Councilor Cogswell? Here. Councilor Groff? Here. Councilor Jordan? Yep. Councilor Linnell? Here. Councilor McGinty? Here. Councilor Reed? Here. Chairman McLaughlin? Here. Would you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have three very special recognitions this evening. We have the Ralph Gould Award for the Citizen of the Year. We have the two state champion soccer teams, the boys and the girls. And we're going to start the evening with the Ralph Gould Award. Tonight, it's my honor to present the Ralph Gould Award for 1996. This award was established in 1986 and was named for the late Ralph Gould to recognize his community service and subsequently to recognize those who provide community service in the same spirit as Ralph Gould. Recipients since Mr. Gould have been Bill Orcutt, who has done much for the youth of the community, Judith Simons, a strong advocate for the arts, recycling, and a school board member, Dick O'Donnell for his efforts on behalf of the elderly, Henry Adams for numerous works on behalf of the town, the late Loretta Pond for her service on school issues, E. Irving Chapel, a former Boy Scout leader and director of emergency preparedness for over 25 years, Peter and Alice Rand for their volunteer work on environmental issues to protect the town's and the state's natural resources, and last year, John Civilly, who has been a volunteer in the Cape Elizabeth Fire Department over several decades. Tonight, we're going to have it done a little differently than it has been in some of the previous years, and I have a confession to make to a couple of women in the audience this evening. I'd like to ask each of them to come up so I can apologize to them. Ellen Van Fleet and Wendy Derzerick. Both, yeah, both of you. <laughs> My confession is I called Ellen and said, I'd love you to be there at the council meeting because we're giving the Ralph Gould Award to Wendy. And I called Wendy and said, I'd love you to be there because we're giving the Ralph Gould Award to Ellen. <laughs> And in fact, Wendy saw me today in town hall and said, why are you calling my husband? <laughs> and I just flat out lied to her and said I'd never done that. <laughs> I couldn't remember. <laughs> so it worked. I'm glad. <laughs> and I really appreciate the support of some of your co-workers and your families in helping to get you here this evening to celebrate. Now, go we'll finish. <laughs> Tonight, we honor these two individuals for their dedication to the community through their service to the Cape Courier. We have Ellen Van Fleet and Wendy Derzerick. Neither is a native of Cape Elizabeth, yet both know this community as well as anyone. Ellen Van Fleet was the co-founder of the Courier, along with former resident Jan Soland. She has been the publisher of the Courier since the beginning and was instrumental in, re in recognizing the need for a community newspaper. She helped to establish its board of directors and its initial mission. The birthing process took well over a year, but from the very first day, all have appreciated the value of Ellen's labor. One of the early moves was to recruit a very capable editor, Wendy Derzerick. A tone was set with the newspaper that stresses the value of community and a well-informed citizenry. Writing from the beginning has been professionally done, but almost exclusively by volunteers. Wendy has been the chief writer, 
the substitute writer, the rewriter, <laughs> and throughout the years, her caref careful attention has ensured that the paper is almost always right. Always <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> While Ellen manages the business side, Wendy has managed the editorial comment, content and comment. <laughs> year after year, deadline after deadline have been met. The production has always looks great thanks to Wendy, Ellen, and the hundreds of volunteers who have assisted the courier over the years. The newspaper is Cape Elizabeth's finest record keeper and serves as a great independent voice for the community. Cape Elizabeth is a much better informed town thanks to the work of the Cape Courier. Ralph Gould, during his later years, was one of the most voracious readers of the Courier. He always was a little embarrassed by the fact that this award was named after him. Today, he would be making calls in great praise of the award recipients. Congratulations to Ellen Van Fleet and Wendy Derzerick on receiving this award, and thank you both for truly honoring Cape Elizabeth with all that you have done for our community. Thank you. And we have individual plaques for them. They read, Town of Cape Elizabeth, Ralph T. Gould Award, presented to Wendy S. Derzerick for Outstanding Citizen Citizenship, 1996. And Town of Cape Elizabeth, Ralph T. Gould Award, presented to Ellen Z. Van Fleet for Outstanding citizen Citizenship, hmm, 1996. There you go, ladies. This was supposed to be Wendy's job. Um, <laughs> she is the one who's done every issue of this paper, every word from beginning to end, and the award is hers. Um, there's some people standing in the back of the room who make this possible, too. Um, Carolyn Young, the ad manager, and Sheila Zimmerman, our, our production gal. I think I tossed, saw Tom Summers come in who's been an invaluable volunteer. There are tons of others. There are a bunch of board members here some friends. <laughs> um, it's, it's really wonderful. Dan Davidson helped start the paper and gave me lots of courage. So to everybody, this is really a community newspaper and we try to keep it that way. Wendy? Um, Ellen said it all. Um, this is really a, a terrific honor to, to be listed among Dick O'Donnell and, and the Rands and, and Ralph Gould himself. I'm overwhelmed. Thank you. The next presentation this evening is for the state championship boys soccer team. Would all of the boys and their coach, if he's here, come up for their recognition, please? And we're going to have Councillor Reed do this one. She's got a special connection with this team. I have to do it without crying and without shaking, so. <laughs> Sick. He really is. Nice to see you again, boys. It's been a long time. Last night, right? <laughs> I will be very happy to uh, read this proclamation to you, but I do want to say um, you have a tremendous record. Your composure on the field, your commitment throughout the season, and the entertainment value you provided to thousands of people this season. Thanks a lot. Uh, formally, uh, the town of Cape Elizabeth with this town council proclamation for the Cape Elizabeth Boys Soccer Maine Class A Championship team. Whereas the Cape Elizabeth Boys Soccer team recently earned the Maine State Class A Championship soccer title, and whereas the championship ended an extremely successful season, including the playing of three games in three days in order to earn the Western Maine title, and whereas the team showed true sportsmanship throughout the season and the ability to overcome the greatest challenges to succeed, including besting a team ranked 16th in the country, 
And whereas this was the second state championship in a row and fourth in five years, and whereas the entire community of Cape Elizabeth is proud of the achievements of the team and the manner in which they are you have represented Cape Elizabeth, now therefore be it resolved by the Cape Elizabeth Town Council and Town Council Assembled that we hereby congratulate the Cape Elizabeth High School Boys Soccer State Champions and we praise them for the honor they have earned for themselves and for the town of Cape Elizabeth dated this 13th of November 1996 by the Town Council members. Thank you very much. Just two things. I want to thank the council very, very much. And it's, I'm very, very proud to be a coach of, of these guys and a coach for Cape Elizabeth. Thank you very much. Now a team that I still have some connections to because my younger daughter was teammate for a lot of these girls. The high school girls soccer team. Please join us up front, ladies, and Charlie. Town of Cape Elizabeth Town Council Proclamation for the Cape Elizabeth Girls Soccer Main Class A Championship. Whereas the Cape Elizabeth Girls Soccer Team recently earned the Maine State Class A Championship Soccer title, and whereas the championship was won beating an extremely competitive team and exceptional teams earlier in the playoffs, and whereas the team showed true sportsmanship throughout the season in earning 14 wins, including a number of close games, and whereas this was the first state championship for girls soccer since 18 yeah, Whoa. since 19 <laughs> wasn't quite that long. <laughs> since 1989, <laughs> and whereas the entire community of Cape Elizabeth is proud of the achievements of this team and the manner in which they have represented Cape Elizabeth, now therefore be it resolved by the Cape Elizabeth Town Council and Town Council assembled that we hereby congratulate the Cape Elizabeth High School girls soccer state champions and we praise them for the honor they have earned for themselves and for the town of Cape Elizabeth dated this 13th day of November 1996 at Cape Elizabeth Maine well done ladies well done Charlie Like Andy, I'd like to thank the council. Uh, I'd also like to thank the town for all the support this year. And I'd like Andy wants to say, uh, say once again how proud I am of these girls for the great job they did all year long. Thank you very much. George is right there. Party. Staff. There's the lights. We left our whole <laughs> Where'd they all go? Continuing with the agenda, we will have reports and correspondence with the council, please. Anybody have any reports or correspondence? Councilman McGinty? Um, I'd like to offer my uh, commendation to the, uh, the men and women of our services here in town during the rain storm. I don't know if the town manager is going to mention this or not, but certainly the many volunteers and the uh, call firefighters from the fire department, the rescue, the wet team, um, the fire police, and, and the police department who put in many, many hours. I, I was at the station myself. I met the town manager over at the station on Monday evening, and some of them were still going the next afternoon. 
um, and uh, they put in many, many hours. And it's kind of a double whammy for them. Not only are they out there in the rain, in the mud, and in, in the potential for uh, for real injury to themselves, but they're also away from their families. And um, so I would like to also commend their families um, for allowing them to help us out during their time of need. Thank you. Councillor Groff. I would uh, like to thank our absent clerk, <laughs> everybody gets a vacation, for the wonderful job done on election day. And also I would like to thank the students who parked their car in another area and everyone who contributed to what was really a very smooth election process here in Cape Elizabeth um, and the high turnout of the citizens uh, coming to vote should also be commended. Thank you. Yes. Councillor Reid. Um, Madam Chairman, I have two reports. One for the uh, Pool Study Committee. We had a meeting today, and we will be reviewing within the next month the recommendations, costs, and analysis by the uh, consultant, and we'll be presenting that uh, to the Joint Town Council School Board in January and to the public uh, at the same time. Um, for the appointments, uh, committee process. It was advertised in the Cape Courier that our standing committees have openings. Uh, we do uh, still have some unfilled uh, and also unapplied for positions and we would like anyone who has an interest in any of the standing committees or the uh, special committee that uh, may be approved later in this meeting on the poor farm property uh, to please notify uh, Barbara Ray at the town manager's office to get the application and uh, submit for consideration and interview um, for an appointment to one of these either short-term or uh, standing committees. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Jordan, is there something coming up with the county budget? I thought you might ask. <laughs> no, I just want to say tomorrow night over to Scarborough Town Hall, 730, there's a review of the county budget. They had one up in Naples, uh, the 7th, yes, 7th of November, and everything, I didn't go, but I got a report back and the ones attended that uh, everything went well and they had very few questions. Was asked about the budget, the budget is down, and I'm not gonna quote any figures on it because sometimes they stick in people's mind and. I'd rather wait until the end of it. So if anybody's interested, tomorrow night, Scarborough Town Hall, 7.30, come and voice your opinion and listen to what the commissioners have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Anybody else? I have a few announcements I'd like to share. I want to follow up um, on Councillor McGinty's thank yous um, relative to our major water problems in the recent past. And the man I want to thank the manager for producing such a comprehensive list of people to be thanked. I think it's worth reading the list on this occasion. The thanks will go to Greg Tinsman, who's our Director for Emergency Preparedness, to his daughter Lindsay Tinsman, the Portland Water District, the Fire Department, our Rescue Unit, the Red Cross Portland Chapter, the National Guard, Poland Spring Water, the School Department, Carabasset Water Company, the Fire Police Unit, our Public Works Department, the WET Team, the Inn by the Sea, I'll just read that one, they agreed to house police officers who might not be able to get home, the Cape Elizabeth House of Pizza, Cumberland County Emergency Preparedness, and FEMA, MDOT, they did repair Scott Dyer Road, the Cape Courier, I'm sorry, most of those folks have left, the local television and radio stations, and our own cable TV channel. Additional thanks need to go to our taxpayers for over the years approving through the budget um, the funds to undertake drainage improvements, some of which we can still be working on. We know we might need some more in the near future. To so many of our citizens who are out there helping to keep leaves out of the catch basins. Our public works crew did a commendable job. It was in this kind of storm event, it was absolutely imperative that the citizens be out there helping and appreciate that kind of help. We also appreciate on the citizens' part their patience <coughs> and understanding. This is a very remarkable storm and they were 
very understanding of the town staff and volunteers who are out there. And the final thank you has to go to those town staff and volunteers for doing a commendable job under some very unusual and trying circumstances. I was at a meeting this morning um, at Greater Portland Council of Governments for the um, Regional Trail Committee. And wanted to, I want to announce two public meetings coming up for the County Regional Trail Plan. One will be on Thursday, November 21st, which would be next Thursday, 7 o'clock at the town office in Wyndham. The second is Tuesday, December 10th, 7 o'clock at the Freeport City, um, Freeport Town Council Chambers. And they are going to be talking about regional activity centers, an off-road public trail network, and different trail uses. And they will have a lot of their very good maps available th both those evenings. If anybody's interested in that, um, you can call Town Hall or call me for more information. Over the past uh, three weeks, anyway, we've had heavy item pickup in town. I believe that was concluded last Friday very successfully, and we expect to have a uh, full report on that um, probably next month. We need to recognize the recent death of one of our town volunteers, Everett Daly, who was a member of our one of our call fire companies. He was also our fire inspector for a number of years, and we're saddened by his passing. And finally, I have an, a memo that I did make available to the council this evening. I apologize it wasn't ready previously, but if you'll notice that the meeting to set this up only happened yesterday morning. And this is to have a regional, regionally represented committee to go through the public um, process of coming up with a name for the new bridge. A number of elected officials met recently, and this was one of the prime topics of discussion. Yesterday, the mayors, I met with the mayors of South Portland and Portland, and based on adv good advice we've been given from our legislative delegation, we are understanding that the best way to approach the naming of the new bridge is to go with one, hopefully one name that has been reached by a consensus on a regional basis and take that to the Transportation Committee of the Legislature, who will then make the recommendation to the full legislature. What we are going to be doing is creating a seven-member committee um, with the members appointed by uh, those two mayors and myself. There will be three representatives each from Portland and South Portland, one representative from Cape Elizabeth. We're trying to fit this into the legislative schedule and are moving very quickly. We have set the first meeting of the committee for Tuesday, November 26th, and members will be chosen by the three of us by the end of next week, uh, November 22nd. I encourage anybody in the audience or in the television audience who's interested in being considered for this as the Cape Elizabeth representative to either be in touch with Town Hall or me directly. And I also encourage the counselors to forward to me any names that they've, of folks they might know of who would be a good candidate for that committee. And we look forward to having them undertake that project. We thank you. Any other announcements, reports, or correspondence? OK. Thank you. We will move on to the minutes of meeting number eight, which was held October 16th. Could I have a motion on that, please? I move we accept the minutes. Thank you. Second. All those in favor? 7-0. We now have a time for citizen discussion of items that are not on the agenda this evening. Is there anybody who would like to take advantage of this time frame? from the audience. Seeing none, we will move to item number 98, which is a report from the Ordinance Committee on the proposed dedication of space at Fort Williams Park, including proposed ordinance and master plan amendments. Councilor Jordan? Yes. The Ordinance Committee met 
October 23rd and 30th to review the proposed amendments to the zoning ordinance at Fort Williams Park Master Plan. The ordinance committee is, is recommending that the current zoning ordinance be amended and the proposed zoning ordinance also discuss surrounding the use of the word permanently in the policy of statement. And uh, what we found out when with our meeting there, it was thought at one time that maybe we could take the section of Fort Williams next to the Surf Road area and bring that into this policy statement as far as the part next to Delo Park where the ball field is proposed or an athletic field, I'll put it that way. I think it's better to put it athletic field. And uh, come up with uh, a change in the policy there of the use of that area. And uh, we had a couple of meetings on it and we've come up with a proposal to, plant, to present to the public on December, what's the date there? I got it here somewhere. This will be December 11th meeting. December hopefully. 11th meeting, excuse me. December <coughs> 11th meeting to uh, hold a public hearing and get the feelings from the public on the proposed change. In, and there's one or two changes that uh, I don't think went 100% with the committee. In fact, I know it didn't. And uh, the restrictions, for one, is what is proposed to put on the green area down by the lighthouse and what is allowed to be done there. And to some of us, it's pretty, it's pretty restrictive as far as I'm concerned as uh, somebody wanted to have a wedding and do some filming down there, which is mentioned there, I think it should be allowed, but you've got to have the number of people you allow and what have you. So these are the things that will come out at the public hearing. And also in it, and I believe other members of the committee will speak on it, that uh, I don't feel that we should have it as permanently dedicated. I think it should be dedicated, but I don't think we should put the word in permanently dedicated. I don't know, you don't know, maybe some of you know, but I think that generation from now that there might be some ideas that would fit into that area or the park and wouldn't destroy it. So when you put that word permanently in there, I think it uh, makes it a little too strong. So I will, you want me to read the, the motion now? Or is there any other member of the committee would like to speak before I read the motion? Motion would be in I, I move. It is recommended a public hearing to be set for your December 11th, 1996 town council meeting at 7.30 p.m. at the town hall. Second. Thank you. Discussion? Councilor Reid. I have some uh, tiny um, suggestions, and uh, then I'd like a question. Um, on page 3, line 41, I was just wondering if we could put the uh, word picnic before the action words, just for the flow of the language, and if that could also be done on line 45, page 1. I just think it reads a little smoother. Um, regarding the policy statement number one on page three, uh, there's a reference to maintains existing views of the shoreline and uh, Portland Headlight. And also it talks about maintained and then the um, buffers just inside the town's property line shall be maintained and enhanced to provide ground level privacy. I was just wondering, um, is that different from what we do now? You want me to? You want me to? Please, Council. 
I don't, I don't think it's any different than what we do now, but what we was thinking of at the time, whether the Delano Park people would be able to see down that corridor there to the pulling headlight or the, whether we should let trees and what have you go up there so it would obstruct their view. Okay, so by this reading though, when it gets up to that eight foot mark, we trim them back so that that corridor of view would be retained? I felt that we should hear and answer that and discuss that after the public hearing. Let's see what the public feels. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Councilor, Councilor Coxall. The, the language um, that refers to the, the level and, and maintaining buffers along the property line are currently stated in the master plan. So um, some of the statements that are in this proposal are scattered throughout the plan and we've brought them all together so it's easy to read and to reference. But those two statements are current practice, is that correct? This, this statement is currently in the master plan, and they talk about maintaining the views of the headlight. Thank you. Councilor Gruff. <clears throat> Obviously, I'll reserve any comments I have on this to after the public hearing, but for people who are thinking of addressing things at the public hearing, if they have any interest in what I'm going to be questioning, uh, I'll be interested in what the word permanently means in this context and whether this town council has the power, even if it wants to, to use that word in the way that uh, many of us think of the word permanently. And secondly, uh, I'll be interested in hearing under informal recreation where it says informal recreation does not involve active team sports, which I certainly understand, or the use of equipment or motorized vehicles. I don't understand what the use of equipment means when previously we talk about Frisbees being okay in this section. And I'll just be interested in hearing comment on that. Not saying any of these, uh, uh, any of these remarks are telling, but just I'd certainly like to, any citizens that have input in that area, I'd be anxious to hear it. Council Council. Perhaps I could um, sort of highlight some of the discussion the Ordinance Committee had in reference to the word permanently. Well, I, I'm just as happy to wait for the hearing to Okay. Do this. Well, if you're sort of putting, I just think that people should know what was really behind it. This was, um, of the phrase was used in the recommendations from the compromise group um, who were in support of not having any field at the fort and this was part of the, the document that we uh, accepted from them to review. But also um, in the use of permanently, I believe our manager can enlighten us as to the fact of whether or not we can use that word. In the usual context it does mean like perpetual and forever. But the manager has, has said that one council cannot bind a, f a future council. Um, with any kind of agreement unless a third party were involved. We also felt that um, the two, two who finally approved having it go through with this term, that having that word included would be a, a flag for any future councils to think very carefully and make sure there's a very open process before any use is approved in those areas. And I don't know if Mr. McGovern wants to say anything further on that now or? Just to reference your point about a third party being involved, what the discussion is is that you'd have to have a third party enforcement such as, such as an outside group would have some sort of easement or restrictive language that they would also be the protector of. But did we not receive legal? Um, correspondence in reference to the binding yes, issue, the, if it were just counsel. Yeah. The, the, legal ad, the legal advice was is exactly as, as Councilor Cogswell stated, that uh, uh, the town does have the right to adopt ordinance, ordinances to, uh, to uh, exercise its legislative function. Uh, future councils also have that right. Uh, and 
you know, the word permanent, will you put it in, sends a strong message to future councils. But, uh, you know, unless there's someone else also enforcing it outside of the community that this council or future council granted the right to do that, uh, it would not uh, be binding upon future councils. It's also interesting. This is not a rec recommended revision to the ordinance. It's a recommended revision to the master plan. That portion of it. This portion. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Okay. Council Linnell. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. On page one, uh, line 13, I just want to make sure I understand what it means, what is meant by existing ball field. That's the Little League field that's up by the offices row. Okay. I'm just, do, do we need to identify that? Any? There's only one. There's only one that's in this, okay. in this particular area that's being described. Councilor Jordan? No, I, they took care of the <coughs> Okay. To answer his question about the number of existing ball fields. Okay. I'm just one, I'm wondering if it, you know, if it, if that's all it, if people yeah. feel that's all it needs. That's all. Just for, in perpetuity, I mean, we, that's all. Okay. Councilor Jordan. I'd just like to throw out, uh, I think the committee would, would say that we would like to look at this as a multi-purpose playing field so it could handle soccer or, or uh, field hockey or even baseball you know what I mean so we didn't want it we didn't want it so much didn't want it designated as particularly a baseball field thank you okay. I'd like to follow up on Councilor Groff's comments and I'm looking at the p top of page two lines one through five Informal recreation does not require prescribed sites or fields and does not require extensive equipment or man-made structures. Informal recreation does not include active team sports or the use of equipment for motorized vehicles but may include programs related to the history of the park. In a number of the earlier drafts, that second sentence read something to the effect does not include active team sports or the use of motorized vehicles or, or motorized vehicles or equipment. I think without having, I think having moved the adjective motorized has changed one part of the original intent. It was saying that we did not, would not allow motorized equipment or motorized vehicles. And I think that the intent has been changed. I know Councillor Jordan and I have had that discussion previously. And yeah, I know it was changed, and I think the way it is now, as Councilor Graf pointed out, it's redundant at best. Well, I think it's inconsistent. I, mean, I don't know if it's redundant. I mean, it, it, it has equipment being used in the definition, like a Frisbee is a piece of equipment, and then it says, but there's no use of equipment. I mean, I just simply don't <coughs> understand. I'm not saying I'm for or against anything. I just don't understand the language. And I don't like us going to public hearing on something that we don't understand. We can, my, we can change what we're doing tonight is deciding what we're setting to public hearing. We can amend <coughs> the language that's presented to us tonight before it's set to public hearing, if we so desire. And I don't know if anybody wants to go through that exercise this evening. But I, you know, I'm concerned about that one. We can change it at public hearing also, but it's, it's awkward to put something to public hearing that we still have questions about. Councilor Jordan? I just, I just want to say that what we was trying to accomplish, I think in a way there, is not to allow these ATVs, snowmobiles, which is motorized, and then allow a motorized lawnmower to operate uh, in those fields. I would be hard pressed to find anybody who would consider using a motorized lawnmower in formal recreation if it's mm -hmm. done for maintenance purposes. Well, okay. You, <laughs> people may have a different, <laughs> may treat their lawnmowers come differently up, than I they do. come up with some pretty <laughs> weird ideas. You'd okay. be surprised at the lengthy conversation we had, the discussion we had about that. <laughs> Anybody wants to recreate in my lawn with a lawnmower, that's great. You know. 
Councillor McGinty. Yeah, I, I'm not prepared to discuss that particular issue. I didn't bring my notes from the meetings, and uh, that was definitely one of the issues we discussed and changed. And I, I, off the top of my head, don't recall all the thinking on that. Similarly, with the word um, permanently, I had some problems with that also um, in regards to what it really meant. Um, and so I, I just soon send this to the public hearing, and we can have a discussions then and get all the input from people who are interested. No, I'm, that's fine with me. I just wanted to point out that we can change things this evening, if we so desire. Yeah. Council Linnell? Well, I was just going to suggest if, if there was anything we could look, look at real quickly to tune it up a little so that we're consistent. Uh, if Councilor Groff had a specific recommendation as to striking a word or anything, I'd, uh, I, I really, I would much rather have it go to hearing because I don't think they're going to be, if we start picking at a word here and picking at a word there, I'd rather get everybody's input uh, and then do it. I think it's inefficient right. to try to do it now. I just thought it was important to give some ideas for people to think about before they make comment and I think all of us have that burden of uh, letting people uh, chew on it a little bit and make their presentation, then we can do it. Thank you. Okay. Any further discussion? I just have a Mr. McGovern? Yeah, just to, the staff will prepare a draft that, that does take care of uh, Councillor Reed's comments, and if anyone else has anything else they want to input to that, we'll, we'll, we'll have some language, but we'll make it very, very clear that it hasn't been acted upon by the Council, just as an alternative line. If anybody has any grammatical and that's, I, that's how I would term Councillor Reed's comment this evening. Yeah. All right, we do have a motion on the floor. All those in favor of setting this to public hearing? All those opposed? 7-0. Thank you. Item number 99 is a proposed council policy clarifying permitted uses on Fort Williams Park Parade Ground and the, port, and the Portland Headlight Field. Count, yeah, Councillor, <laughs> sorry about that. Mr. McGovern. Yes, early last spring there were a number of questions, uh, particularly on the entry field as one goes into Fort Williams and whether or not certain teams were allowed there and if they were there, what to do about them, particularly our parks maintenance crews and the police department need a little bit of guidance on how to deal with it. Uh, from that, based on looking at the master plan, looking at uh, past policies of the Fort Williams Commission actually spent probably five or six hours on it, uh, determined that there really wasn't a written policy, uh, even though there was, there was certain intent all over the place in, in terms of the language, but never been a written policy. In, in response to the need to do something to respond to complaints and issues, I drafted at that point an administrative clarification policy, uh, which I uh, shared with the Council at the, at the time as well as with the Fort Williams Advisory Commission. Uh, at last month's meeting, the Fort Williams Advisory Commission actually adopted it as, uh, as their desired policy uh, for the park. And I have a draft before you this evening that takes their recommendation that they approved on uh, October 17th and merely changed a few words uh, to make it more closely uh, adaptable to what you just set for public hearing for next month. Councilor Cogsell. Yes, um, I'd like to propose a motion on this item. Please. And in this motion, I have a redraft of paragraph two. <coughs> um, paragraph two would read, the two fields are not for the use of teams of any organized sport and shall not be scheduled for any team activity. They shall be open for walking, frisbee throwing, catch, cross country, skiing, sledding, and similar activities. The reason I'm, um, I thought that we need to talk about use of teams of organized sp sports is a reference down at the bottom to organized sports. Um, we should use the same term if frisbee throwing and sliding is now called sledding, just to make the, um, the terminology similar to what is proposed. Could you give the beginning of that sentence again, please? The two fields are not for the use of teams of any organized sport, which is what was in the original draft, and shall not be scheduled for any team activity. 
They shall be open for walking, frisbee throwing, catch, cross country skiing, sledding, and similar activities. I can give a copy to the manager. Clerk Pro Tam. <laughs> Council Linnell. Uh, a yeah. question for Council Cargasol. Uh, <coughs> I don't think she mentioned sunbathing, and I'd hate to have that thrown out. Is that a? It could be a similar activity. I don't think we need to advertise sunbathing necessarily. It's not included in any of the other drafts. It's passive, <laughs> informal. It's not a team it sport. <laughs> <laughs> it's an unorganized piece. No equipment necessary. Councillor Jordan. <laughs> Councillor Jordan. <laughs> Save me. <laughs> I did make a motion. No, I, ju I just want to say that I no. don't quite understand what she has thrown out here. Because I would think if that area there, a little league team wanted to practice or play somebody in there and they could find one up, I think they should be allowed to do it. I don't think we should <laughs> try to set in restrict the fort so I got to see if I'm able to walk there and throw a frisbee or toss a ball to somebody else and figure it's organized or not organized if there's two or three there playing a game of kickball I'll put it that way. Mm -hmm. Councillor Reid. Um, I agree with Councillor uh, Jordan. I, I'm concerned until we have resolved the issue at Lions Field and with the uh, multi-purpose field at Fort Williams that we uh, strict, uh, restrict um, what is available uh, somewhat flat even uh, with the gopher holes. Um, and uh, I'm concerned about uh, setting this um, uh, in such uh, permanent form. Um, I am also have a comment, if we do adopt this and the winter activities include cross-country skiing and uh, sledding replaces sliding, um, we should also add tubing and tobogganing and other similar activities because um, cross-country skiing and sledding or sliding should not be the only ones allowed, in my opinion. Councilor McGinty. My only question on this is the timing. Um, what um, the chairman of the ordinance committee did not mention was that the ordinance committee had also requested a study or uh, some staff work be done to determine what exactly was the dedicated open space and the natural area of the fort as previously dedicated. Um, as we were sitting in our ordinance committee meeting when we tried to overlay supposedly an official map of what was permanently dedicated it didn't match up with what we all understood was dedicated. Mm -hmm. And so we had asked that st some staff work be done to find out exactly which parts of the fort had been dedicated to what purposes, some for natural areas, some um, for open space. And we may be premature with this, or maybe not premature with the policy, but we may want to find out exactly what that research comes back with. It's, we're scheduled to have a meeting on November 21st to receive that information. And um, it may directly address this issue of what can be done in that area as designated by some previous authority. And we're not even sure who that authority may be. There's some discussion that when the land was purchased by the town that there were some restrictions put on the land. Well, that's, that's one issue that's come up. I mean, that's been said. So that's what we're waiting to see is what exactly has been dedicated open space and natural area. And we may just want to table this until we get that report back and have a better understanding. Mr. McGovern, what happens if, you know, do you have any problems if we postpone action on this? No, I, I do think if you postponed action and you didn't deal with it prior to spring, you're, you're leaving a, a, a real vacuum in terms of, you know, anyone shows up there and plays, whatever they want to do, you know, we have another major athletic field, so uh, I would uh, really hope that if you tabled it, you would make sure you address it in sufficient time before spring. I would feel uncomfortable leaving this to the spring playing season, but it's my full intention to resolve the Fort Williams item that we've 
set to public hearing next month and to resolve this before springtime. At this point, I'd like to, Mr. Mc I think there is. I think there's a motion on, on the board. No, it was not seconded. Okay. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to, if, if we get the information we need on November 21st, we can, we can address this next month. I'm not trying to delay this. I just want to have all the information in front of me to make a, you know, a rational decision, an informed decision. I'd entertain the tabling motion to next month. Uh, move the table till uh, December 11th. Thank you. Second. Thank you. Further, uh, no, no discussion. All those in favor? Opposed? 7-0. If I may, we do have all that information now. We had it when we did the research to come up with this in the, the spring. I think it was when I wasn't at that meeting, and yeah. Maureen, I don't think, was fully aware of it, so we do have it. Thank you very much. Item number 73 is an item that was tabled last month. It's a report from the Chief of Police on Shore Road Safety. Could I have a motion to remove from the table, please? So moved. Second. All those in favor? 7-0. Thank you. Mr. McGovern? Yes, I'm not, I had expected the Chief to be here. I'm not too sure uh, why he's not here. I, I think he did a, an excellent summary of some of the various issues of Shore Road. when. <coughs> The staff approached this issue. We didn't feel that it was our role to question the action that the town council took uh, a month or two ago, two months ago, on the vote on Shore Road Bikeway. Uh, we, we weren't about to reopen that issue. Uh, we felt that you had asked us to really look at how we could best address safety. Uh, I think the chief, you know, makes a number of good suggestions here based on uh, some some excellent study in terms of having done speed checks, looking at causation of accidents, uh, looking at frequency of accidents, looking at property damage, and you know, really going back over uh, oh about eight or nine years of, of data. Uh, his specific recommendations that he uh, developed as a result of uh, the effort is that uh, one, we should consider present design road and shoulder conditions. Uh, considering the present road and shoulder, shoulder decision, we shouldn't proactively uh, promote pedestrian use and bicycle use of Shore Road. Not to say that people couldn't do it, but as a community, we should not proactively encourage that use. Uh, second, we should add some more deer crossing signs uh, to let people know where the, where the deer uh, are prone to cross. Uh, three, hidden drive uh, signs in a number of locations. Uh, for increased speed enforcement from Wood Road to Old Fort Road and from Dyer Pond Road to Dyer's Edge Road, Tide's Edge Road. Uh, shoulders, there's a, there's a real issue with shoulders in terms of some of the drop off and the unevenness of it and the fact that they haven't been maintained as well as they should. He recommends that we take action to better maintain uh, the road. And finally, I think the most significant recommendation is to reduce the speed limit from the old entrance to Fort Williams, which is the the one across from Rocky, what's the name of that old place? Uh, I'm trying to think. The, the Rock, Rock Craft Inn. Old, what was the name of that place, Councilor Jordan? Across from the old Fort Williams entrance. From Anyway, I think everyone knows where I'm talking about. From there uh, down to the intersection of Route 77 to reduce the speed limit from 35 miles per hour to 30 miles per hour, which would uh, be a significant change in the community, would add a tremendous measure of safety uh, simply because of the response times, because of the, uh, the people being able, because they're moving a lot slower to see a lot better in and around the intersections, in and around the curves and the various intersections to see the folks. I, I think he, he did a real good job in this report and uh, I would think that you'd, you'd want to uh, give it some uh, special attention either at a workshop or uh, uh, some other time. I, I also do want to mention that the current traffic engineer for MDOT, who plans to retire in February, uh, has indicated that he is supportive of reducing the speed limit from 35 mm. to 30. Councillor Reid. Um, I uh, enthusiastically support the uh, recommendation to reduce the speed limit, and I was wondering uh, if, uh, regardless of some of the other recommendations uh, in that report, in light of the uh, pending retirement and the fact that at public hearings we heard that um, stated more than once and in the P2 committee there was extensive discussion about the reduction of that speed limit. 
if we could uh, call out that element and take uh, somewhat immediate action on that since the process probably is a request to MDOT with the support of the council and the chief of police uh, we would probably have a better uh, chance at having that reduced than we would otherwise um, so I would make that motion that um, we um, request the town manager to inform uh, MDOT uh, after this vote, uh, assuming it passes, uh, of our, the town council's desire, uh, with the support of our public safety uh, chief of police, to lower the speed limit on the segment of Shore Road designated by the town manager. I'll second. Further discussion on that motion. Councilman Nell. Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. I think, uh, you know, there's certainly some, uh, that's one thing that we perhaps need to do. Um, in reading this report, uh, there's something that I, I didn't really see addressed in here completely, and I think we may be, uh, maybe perhaps it's a reaction to some of the uh, discussion of the Shore Road issue uh, in the recent past. But um, it, the, this, this uh, study identifies the, the narrowness of the road, I think, in the site and in, mo in so many words, uh, t well, it talks about the, the site distance being restricted. And I'm wondering, while before the, our friends, friend at MDOT retires, uh, if perhaps we should uh, invest a little something in, in looking into uh, you know, modest engineering of the site distances to get an understanding of what they are. And uh, I'm not talking about a major reconstruction, but I'm just wondering if we could s mitigate those uh, site distances, uh, uh, given that it's, uh, I mean, in, and I'm looking at page 11, it says, in short, it is remarkable that relatively few serious accidents have occurred along this roadway. And I'm just wondering if it's something we could uh, look at. Are you offering an amendment, or do you want yeah, to I'd have a separate motion on that? Well, I'd, I'd, later? I'd offer it as an amendment to. Uh, to uh, do a, a very uh, preliminary uh, engineering study of the site distances on Shore Road. Is there a second to the amendment? Seeing none, the amendment does not go any further. Any further discussion on the motion to request MDOT to reduce the speed limit? Councillor Jordan. No, I just. I don't think I can add anything to what has been said, but I just want to throw out that I think the chief done a tremendous job on this, and I do support a reduction in the speed limit, and I don't think there's too many people that really exceed. The, they can set for 35 and 40 before anybody's going to bother you too much. I don't know why you're grinning, Council McGinney. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so I think if it was down to 30, and I support 30, uh, and it's still, you know, going to get roped in until you're over 35. So. Thank you. I purposely drove part of Shore Road at 30 miles an hour tonight, so I know I can do it. And I know there's some members of the audience who <laughs> drive Shore Road a lot, too. Any further discussion on this motion? <coughs> All those in favor? 7 0 in that motion. Any other motions or discussion? That should be Southerly. Thank you. Um, just for a um, point of information for the Council on page 12 in the listing of recommendations, I had noted, and Council Cogswell has also noted, along with the manager and the rest of you. Um, recommendation number one, considering present design road and shoulder conditions, pedestrians and bicyclists should not be encouraged to use Shore Road from Fort Williams Park, should be southerly to the town center. If you go north, you go to South Portland and not to Cape Elizabeth from there. Mike, I'll just pose a question on that. Actually, it was, um, came up in discussion at that regional trails um, meeting that I was at this morning. There are state publications that show Shore Road as a place for bicycles to go. You know, if we're not, I understand the recommendation, you know, 
saying that we should not encourage people to use Shore Road, but I think there has to be, we have to be very realistic and understand that the encouragement may come from parties over whom we have no control. And that the fact is that there is going to be increased usage, usage on that road by non-motorized means of travel, regardless of anything this council and this town does. Councillor Groff? I'm just a little unsure where we're going in the sense that I have problems with one also because uh, if we adopted such a policy and then uh, at the same time we uh, had uh, a, some sponsored walk and, you know, people were down Shore Road and we knew it, I, mean, I just think there's a problem with, with one. But I'm more concerned about how we're going to address the other recommendations, and I was hopeful tonight uh, that we would find some consensus on some of the recommendations and, the, uh, and be able to implement them right away, and the other recommendations where there was going to be some discussion have a set time when we would do that. For example, recommendation two about additional deer crossing signs. For the public who hasn't read this report, uh, hitting deer is probably the major, one of the, uh, the primary cause of accidents on Shore Road. <laughs> I can't conceive of anybody on this council opposing recommendation two, and especially for people who don't live around here, to let them know that we have a lot of deer, uh, and they cross the road at select at different places. Uh, I don't see any reason to wait on that, and I was hoping that if there was a consensus and we went through some of these recommendations and the simple ones like that, if there was consensus, we could do those tonight and move forward. The ones that we need discussion on, let's set them aside and uh, pick a date and we'll have discussion. Would you like to make a motion for some of the simple ones, please? Sure. Well, in my mind, uh, I would, I, we, I think perhaps we could do them uh, one at a time and, and I would be more than happy uh, unless it's unanimous, to set it aside and uh, then have discussion about it. Because I think if there's anybody who doesn't want it, I'm more than happy to set it aside for discussion. So only if people unanimously think that we can uh, uh, move forward, that would be my, how I would like to do it, by consensus rather than a, a, a straight vote. And in that, in that uh, light, I would, I personally would be more than happy tonight to uh, vote for recommendation two concerning deer crossing signs, recommendation three, the hidden drive signs uh, to be installed as necessary between Delano Park entrance one to Chimney Rock and at Lawson Road southbound. I personally would also be more than happy to vote for uh, increased speed enforcement or reworded uh, a recommendation to the chief at his discretion to uh, have increased speed enforcement because I think it's inconsistent to have a lower speed limit and not have some enforcement. Uh, the shoulders, I don't think we have enough information on number five because I don't know how we do that. Uh, but So those three I would be more than happy to vote on tonight if it was unanimous and I don't want to mean, I don't want to take the time tonight if it's not. Okay, let's, we have a motion on the floor for Recommendations two, three, and four. Do we have a second? Second. I'll second. Discussion on those. Councilor Linnell. Um, I think those are fine, and I just want to comment that uh, if we're not looking at the uh, at the sight distance issue at all, I think we're not using one of the tools that we have to address this issue. And I think it's a uh, unfortunately, I think it's an ostrich approach to the the uh, uh, problems on Shore Road. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Reid. Um, I would just like to add that um, I believe we have um, signs that say soft shoulders. And there are a couple of places that are worse than uh, others. And maybe if we can, that doesn't have to be part of the motion, just but uh, for a statement. Also, um, I think uh, everyone who reads the Cape Courier knows that I hit a deer um, last month on the way to the town council meeting. And I would just uh, stress that although I've traveled that road many times, I didn't realize how often they cross there until everyone who lives there said, oh, yeah, they do that all the time. Um, so if uh, we could, at appropriate places throughout the town, uh, mark those spots because I, I know I'm not the only one who's hit a deer this month. Thank you. 
want to commend you for hitting the deal. Councillor Jordan. It's one less that I have to feed. <laughs> I would just want to say that uh, on page 11, the picture there of the shoulder, I think that is essential to fix them shoulders because it, if anybody is jogging or what have you, they got to step down pretty well to get off the road. So some of those things that I think is equally as important is the signs. I would agree with Councillor Groff's inclination to put off the discussion of shoulders until we can get perhaps some financial information and the type of improvements being proposed, if it's going to be gravel or paved and what the cost per linear foot would be and what the width of the shoulder would be. I agree fully that it needs to be addressed having, you know, had some experiences where I've encountered the shoulders more quickly than I thought I was going to have to. Councillor McGinty. Um, two things. On number four, the increased speed enforcement, I'd like to see some feedback from the town manager regarding what that entailed and what, what kind of numbers there might be there, what exactly has been done in that regard. We can get that from, from you. You mean after it's approved? After it's approved. Okay. Yes. So see, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, and the other issue I have is the signs. I'm going to support the motion, but the problem I have with the signs, if we have a sign every 10 feet, you know, they're cautionary signs. They, they kind of lose, um, you know, the reason that they're there. Um, so I, I think we need to be judicious in how we, where and how we put up these signs. There's a lot of hidden drives on Shore Road. You could have a sign every 25 feet. And I think that they have to be. There's only two that are recommended. Is that what he said? According to the map. There's only okay. two. Yeah. Like the whole road's a hidden drive. Yeah, okay. And the same with the deer, deer crossing signs. And uh, there have been the last, I've noticed the last six months or maybe last year, that there have been a number of deer crossing signs put up where there are known deer crossings. So they are up. <coughs> Thank you. Councilor Groff. I agree with Councilor Jordan, and I, I think that the shoulders have to be addressed. But the reason I didn't include it uh, is that I just can't vote for something that I don't know how much it'll cost. Oh, I see. And once we get that straightened out and we can see uh, see the cost, then I think then that's a fair discussion. But since that information isn't here, uh, I just felt uncomfortable. Thank you. Councilor yeah. Coxell. Sorry, Al. He had his hand up first. Oh, I, I just wanted to say the Public Works Director, we went out and looked at the road shoulders and our concern is if we're doing them, you know, you've got to do them fairly right. And they have machines now that come in and actually lay out a shoulder that have the right material of gravel. And it's a lot, a lot more efficient. He, de he did receive an estimate, actually, from a contractor to do that. So it's ready to go. The reason I don't have it exactly here before you is even I was a little bit unsure as to exactly where it was going. And I wanted to be extremely comfortable knowing the sensitivity on Shore Road. Uh, where it's going. So we can easily have that f for you next month. Uh, on uh, all the other signs, you know, we can get those up, get those up pretty quick. We also, I did want to mention while I have the opportunity, uh, is that the Chief of Police has been working on a research project over the last week uh, looking at the whole deer issue and traffic. And he's just about has completed, uh, last time I was over there yesterday, a report uh, detailing every accident over the last few years where it's been and what we plan to do is to get that out in the courier again so the people uh, locally know where the problems are as well as to post it on our, our internet homepage as well so that uh, visitors coming to Cape Elizabeth can be forewarned if they check out that resource so uh, we are really trying to get the word out because it is Councilor Groff mentioned he said a number of accidents it was 22 percent of the accidents on Shore Road were 21.8 percent I think were as a res result of deer car collisions. Thank you. Councilor Cogsell. Well, I'm glad that the manager spoke before I did because I understood our motion in June to also get information through the Public Works Director to deal with shoulders. And we do need that before we can make an intelligent vote, as well as dealing with site distances. We just can't willy-nilly um, say we're going to do it until we really know how much it's going to cost and what particular areas are going to be um, studied and we can discuss that in a workshop format. 
Council Linnell? I hope we do just uh, go a little further with that. Uh, for example, I know tonight we're on the agenda. We'll be talking about the Thomas Jord former Thomas Jordan property, and, and um, I'm, I'm guessing that uh, there'll be some support to spend $1,500 studying uh, something that is not any kind of an emergency situation. Um, I think it. I'm just going to be stubborn. I think it, it would be prudent to at least uh, look at uh, the site distances on that road and and although I think these are fine recommendations I'm going to be stubborn tonight and I'm not going to vote for any of them and if we're not going to uh, look at the site distances on Shore Road. Thank you that's certainly your privilege. Councillor I Reed. move the question. Thank you. The motion is to proceed with recommendations two, three, and four. All those in favor? All those opposed? Six to one. Councillor and opposed. I will work with the manager to bring to a workshop discussion recommendations one and five, recommendation five with some financial figures and also to add a consideration of looking at mitigating site distances and what some of the methods and costs for that can be. I think there are different methods and costs depending on the causation of the site distance problem. Anything else on this item? Thank you. And I personally would like to thank the police chief. I think that was a well-presented report. We, it was worth the wait. Madam Chairman, I just have a, should we have acknowledged receipt of this report as an official receipt of it or not? Will the minutes please reflect that? Thank you. Without objection. I see no objection. You objected. I'm just trying to take notes. You, you know, it's difficult. It's I'm not used to all this work. <laughs> we have three items proposed for consent calendar agenda this evening. Is there anybody who wishes any of those removed for discussion? Councillor Reid. Uh, item number 100, please. Okay. Anything else removed for discussion? I only have a question on number 102, and what, what is the date? To set the public hearing will be on December 11th. We'll have a lot of public hearings next month. Mm -hmm. All right, let us take item number 100, which is approval of lease of space at Town Hall for the Cape Courier. Mm -hmm. Councillor Reed. I have a question regarding the term. Uh, it talks about 12 months beginning September 1st. Uh, today is uh, November something, and um, November 13th. And I was wondering if uh, there were uh, a reason um, to go back to September 1st other than that the other one lapsed. Um, and could we start with November 13th and go 12 months hence? Doesn't matter. Whatever you'd like. I, I assume the courier, you know, they seem to be happy tenants, so uh, I assume they wouldn't object. Uh, I would just suggest we uh, move out 12 months forward. Would you like to make a motion, please, Councillor? Uh, yes. Um, I move that we accept the agreement of lease um, stated uh, as item number 100, with the exception of item number 2 term, to have and to hold for a term of 12 months commencing on November 13, 1996, and ending, uh, let's go uh, December 31st, uh, 1996. No. So we would go till uh, November 13th, 1997. Do you want to make that? commencing September 1 so that we would have been in a lease situation for the last couple of months. Yeah, and that's what I didn't know if it mattered. It's just a technicality, but I think we'd be covering ourselves better if we did that. Do you want to make it September 196 to December 3197? I really would. We'll do yeah. it then. So, uh, <laughs> So the term um, shall be to have and to hold for a term of 15 months, commencing on September 1st, 1996, and ending um, on December 31st, 1997. Thank you. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you. Discussion? All those in favor? 7-0. Thank you. We now have two items on the consent calendar. Item number 100 is a proposal 
to change the date of the December 1996 town regular town council meeting from Monday, December 9th to Wednesday, December 11th. Same time, same place. The reason for that being that a number of councillors are not able to attend on that Monday evening. Um, item number 102 is to set a public hearing, which would be on December 11th at 7.30 at Town Hall for revisions to the general assistance regulations. I have a motion on consent calendar, please. So moved. Thank you. Second? Second. All those in favor? 7-0. Thank you. Item number 103 is a request from the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust for the town to assist with the purchase of Hobstone undeveloped land. Mr. McGovern? Yes, uh, there's representatives here this evening of both the Hobstone Owners Association <coughs> and the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust. Uh, this issue comes before you as a result of uh, the efforts of a number of citizens of, of both groups, uh, the leaders of which are of whom I hear this leaders of which groups, which, which groups which groups are here this evening. Uh, I think it's, it's most graphically shown on the map on the right, and members of the Land Trust will probably explain, I would imagine, the, the map on the left. But if you look at that map on the right, or in back of the podium as the camera's looking at it, the purple area at the bottom is the current developed portion of, of Hubstone. The blue portion at the top is the undeveloped portion. When this was approved by the planning board, there were it was due to be 33 units to go into this area. Uh, the Hubstone Owners Association prefers that 33 units not be built in this area and that instead the, uh, the condominium development essentially end with the, with the current 66 units, if I have that number right. Uh, in, and the, they've worked with the land trust whereby the Hubstone Owners Association would contribute a pool of funds, the town would contribute 25000 toward the $75,000 uh, purchase amount, and the balance would be raised uh, by the land trust. And as representative of the land trust here to explain more, as well as the Hubstone Owners Association, as well as to show how it fits into the Cape Elizabeth Greenbelt. The funds would come from the land acquisition fund, uh, which does have a balance uh, sufficient, just barely, uh, to uh, pay for the 25000 proposed donation. Thank you. Who would like to go first, gentlemen? <coughs> My name is Nat Clifford. I'm a uh, <coughs> member of the board of directors of the Land Trust. And as Mike said, we've uh, been negotiating with uh, the bank that owns the uh, property and also with the Homeowners Association working in conjunction with them. Uh, I didn't realize uh, when we started this how complicated it is undoing a condominium. I've created several, and, and uh, I, I think any lawyer here would uh, back me up that it, it really is, is even stickier than uh, putting one together. Um, the um, key interest uh, uh, really is twofold in our part. Number one, this uh, parcel represents an intersection of uh, two conservation easements, uh, a little bit better shown on this uh, town-wide map, some of it may uh, be a little hard to read from uh, your angle there, but uh, this is the site described uh, on the top of, of uh, this one here. There is an easement which comes down from Canterbury Hills and ends at this site. There's a second easement existing now that um, actually through a, a strange turn of events does not go all the way to Mitchell Road, but does go off Hobstone Road somewhere uh, in the area along here and goes back to Hobstone Road, as I say, not all the way to Mitchell Road, and then extends through the um, parcel that we're talking about buying. Uh, as you'll see on this map, the two easements do not uh, come together as was hoped uh, years ago when they were put together. What is part of this uh, purchase uh, uh, that we're proposing to enter into is an easement which uh, extends all the way to Mitchell Road, goes back up onto the parcel, we then would acquire the entire parcel which would grant access back to the easement uh, on uh, Canterbury. A second factor that's uh, at this point a little bit nebulous, but you have Fort Williams, you have Stonegate, 
And uh, these two parcels really do connect as a road that goes into Stonegate. And as you can see with a darkened area, there are easements through Stonegate. Um, if you go back onto a road system, you can actually get around to this parcel of land. As I say, this is a bit of a stretch right now, but uh, as with most of the green belt and parcels that have been put together, it's hoped that uh, someday we may be able to acquire either easements or actual ownership of maybe some uh, interconnecting parcels. So there are two easements which do uh, uh, enter onto this parcel that, that uh, would open up uh, access between the two of them, plus the possibility of uh, more access from uh, Fort Williams. And the eventual uh, goal of the Greenbelt system is to get from Fort Williams all the way through town out to the uh, Crescent Beach and Two Lights area. The second uh, important feature of the site, it's 20 acres, uh, at present undeveloped and, and uh, uncleared, unspoiled. It's all wooded and uh, would be a wonderful destination, which a lot of our acquisitions uh, uh, do constitute, a place where you can go to cross-country ski, hike, picnic, or whatever. So uh, from those two aspects, and they're, they're really uh, the prime criteria of, of uh, all of our acquisitions, uh, this is a very important site to us. Um, the obvious benefit to the Homeowners Association uh, uh, is, uh, I think, uh, offset by their our participation in the acquisition. To date, they've raised over $30,000 towards the, the $75,000 purchase price. Uh, we would propose to go out for a fundraiser in early December, hoping to catch some of the year-end uh, 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 tax deductions or donations that would create tax deductions for this year. We've got to wait until the Homeowners Association takes their final vote to be able to go out uh, knowing that uh, this is a doable project. Um, the Funds uh, would come, as I said, the Homeowners Association is, has already raised 30000 uh, I think it's around 22000 now would be available at closing. Um, if the town were willing to contribute uh, 25000 the land trust proposes to uh, take out a mortgage for the balance, and the terms have been made very attractive by the bank because they are anxious to uh, get rid of the property. Um, the uh, precedent for this. Uh, I don't know, uh, I know you, Bill, were on the council back then, but we appealed to the town back when we acquired the uh, Jordan parcel, which was the only link around the Great Pond trail system that was broken. Uh, uh, the, the easements went all the way around the pond except for that. And the um, cost of that property was 150000 and the town uh, made available to us uh, 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 50,000 of that or a third, which happens to be the arithmetic uh, on this one. Um, if you're willing to grant uh, these funds, what we would propose is to extend an easement to the town, uh, as we've done on many of the parcels around town. This gives us double coverage. The land trust owns the land and the town uh, owns an easement, so you really are locking it up uh, through two entities, making it a lot more difficult for future groups to uh, turn loose. and. Uh, that easement would provide for pedestrian access, non-motorized, and, and uh, it's my understanding that a, a copy of that has been forwarded to the town manager to, in turn, be forwarded to the uh, town attorney for his review. Um, finally, uh, we propose our contract with the bank uh, provides for a closing on <coughs> the 1st of March, and we propose to close sometime in February, <coughs> and uh, the funds would need to be available then. Um, that's all I have. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And Richard Haupt from the uh, Hobstone Homeowners Association is here uh, that can answer any questions from that end of it. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for Mr. Clifford from the council? Mr. McGovern, you have a comment? Yeah, I just wanted to make an initial comment. Uh, Mr. Clifford referenced the town attorney. I did have a discussion with the town attorney on this today. And he as well as received a letter from him. And he stressed that this is a very, very complicated transaction, as, as you know, <laughs> emphasizing what Nat said as well. Uh, undoing a condominium is not easy, and all the, sig the signatures that you need uh, for that, and these gentlemen have learned that and have worked very, very hard on it. Uh, also, uh, you know, the conservation easements, he has not had an opportunity to review. Uh, he, he has no objection, you know, to the town doing it, but he just stressed that uh, 
you know, we ought to be very careful to make sure we have all the, you know, since the town would eventually be a party to this, that we do have all the agreements and that he has an opportunity to review them. Thank you. Council I just Jordan. got one, one question that I think people out there might be listening to. What would be the difference in the taxes to the taxpayers when this, when this proposition goes through? Well, it was, as I understand it, a buildable piece of property. And then it would be taken over as a conservation. If you assume the land is valued at $100,000, the taxes would be currently $1,856 per year. Uh, when it's owned by the land trust, it would still have somewhat of a value and they would still pay taxes, but the assessor would determine that value. Obviously, with all these restrictions on it, it would be considerably less than $75,000 uh, once all those restrictions are placed on it. Thank you. It is preferable in my mind for the tax reasons that the land trust hold the deed and the town hold an easement rather than vice versa. That way it does stay somewhat on the tax rolls. Councilor O'Neill. I'd just like to thank Mr. Clifford and uh, if we're ready for a motion, I'd make the motion. Certainly. Um, I move that we set uh, the, uh, <coughs> the request from the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust uh, to assist with the purchase of Hobstone undeveloped land to a public hearing, uh, December 11th, 1996, at 7.30. I'll second. Do we have discussion on the motion? Hearing your time frame tonight, I'm comfortable with, you know, with having our public hearing. It doesn't, does not appear that you need action from the council this evening. I very much appreciate your informing the council about this. I've been informed previously. I think some of the other councillors may have heard about this from some of your members. And I will say for one, I certainly intend to support this next month and look forward to working with the land trust again. I get a little bit concerned, I just need to say this to the rest of the council, that this really depletes our land acquisition fund. And I'm certainly hoping that those of us who are supportive of this are also going to be supportive during the budget process of adding monies to that fund. and hope that there will be support from the citizenry to do that. So when this kind of opportunity presents itself, we can do what I hope will happen next month. Councilor McGinty. Could I just ask Mr. Clifford one question? Is there any known opposition to this purchase by the land trust? None that I can think of. Uh, I've asked some of my cohorts on the land trust. Uh, Richard, your group, I... Uh, what, would you come to the microphone and please identify yourself? Thank you. My name is Richard Haupt, and uh, I'm a member of the Hobson board, but I'm not appearing as a, uh, uh, as a member of the board, really. Uh, I guess uh, I was helped to be instrumental in getting this thing started. Uh, the only known opposition uh, that I could think of might possibly be two negative votes which came through when we asked for the initial survey. Of course, the, the main point to, uh, to cover in the beginning was to determine whether or not the owners uh, at Hopstone now were willing to change the declarations. And for that, our declarations call for, uh, our rules call for 90 percent approval. Uh, actually, we had two dissenting votes. Uh, so if you look at it the other way, out of 66 now, we would then have 64. We have started getting some of the proxies back now, and they've all been positive. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Any further questions, comments? We have the motion for public hearing next month. All those, oh, Council, no, no, all those in favor? <laughs> all those opposed? 7-0. Thank you very much. We'll see you next month, mm -hmm. folks. Mm -hmm. Item number 104. Is a request to complete construction of the accepted portion of Columbus Road. Mr. McGovern? Oh. Councillor Groff. In reviewing this, uh, on this particular item, I noticed that one of my law partners uh, represents a party, and for that reason, I will uh, 
recuse myself from any thing to do with this matter. All right. Thank you. Mr. McGovern. Yes, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, as you can probably tell from this correspondence, or maybe not, uh, yeah, this goes back to May, I believe, when, uh, might have even been April, when uh, Mr. Waldo Hayes, a resident at the end of Columbus Road, first approached me. What, what happened was, back in the 1960s, the town accepted uh, the, some of the various roads and the development which includes Columbus Road. Uh, in accepting Columbus Road, we accepted a portion of the road as a public road, including a portion of it that was not yet built, uh, we meaning the town. Uh, Mr. Hayes raised the issue with us that we had an obligation to complete that road uh, under the laws of the state of Maine. I said, what? Or, or something like that. <laughs> and I was a little bit surprised and uh, we ended up having a little legal research done, and uh, our, the attorneys who, at the Maine Municipal Association who were far more expert on this informed us that Mr. Hayes is correct, uh, that we do have an obligation to uh, do one of two things. Uh, one is to either uh, complete the construction of the road as it was originally uh, accepted by the community, or two, to discontinue it as a public road that would, we would still have fee in it, but we would not have uh, the road con constructed. Uh, if we took that latter route, we would have to have appraisals done, we'd have to pay damages to the abutters. Uh, it, it gets to be an expensive process. Uh, we've had the town engineer, or the, the previous town engineer, go out there a number of times to look at it develop a couple of cost estimates. We've had a number of discussions with <coughs> Mr. and Mrs. Hayes, with Mr. Hoare, uh, the resident on the opposite side of the street, including a meeting with the town engineer this past week. Uh, the current situation with this is that it, w it would appear that we have an agreement between the engineer and the two parties involved, the Hayes and uh, Mr. and Mrs. Hoare, that uh, 75 feet would be sufficient. Uh, the estimated cost of that to complete it is $15,000. At one point we thought it was a lot more than that because of uh, the fact that uh, there was a water line there that we thought was much higher than it ended up being. Uh, you know, it's obvious if any of you have looked at it, the reason it wasn't finished is a big mound of rock there. Uh, the residents at the end of the road, uh, the, the two parties involved, both, you know, I think have some legitimate concern that their homes don't have the frontage uh, along the road that they're entitled to under this law, and as a result, it doesn't give them full use of their property to access the, the full sections uh, of their roads. The, there is a, a third option here, in addition to discontinuance or accepting at the full length, and that is to do a combination of building the road, say the 75 feet that they're appearing to agree to, and then discontinuing the, the balance of it. Uh, the, the one piece of information I don't have here that I would like to have in time for a public hearing next month is exactly, now that we know where the water main is, I haven't received the cost estimate from the engineer as to what it would be to complete it to its end, as accepted. You know, right now, there's only an estimate for the 75 feet. And I, I want to be sure that when you vote on this, if you set up a public hearing next month, that you have that estimate. You know, if we do go that option, you know, I would plan to have some discussions just to the 75 feet with the parties involved to see if they're willing to waive their right to come after the town for damages if we don't do the portion between the 75 feet and the balance in exchange, sort of an agreement for the, the town honoring its legal commitment to do the, the first 75 feet. What is that balance, Mr. McGovern? I don't, it's about, we measured, it's about 100 feet total, about another 25 feet, is that right? About another 25 feet. 95, so it's another 20 feet. My, my sense is I just assume do the, if we're going to do it, the full 95. But I just, I, I don't like to commit to anything before I know what it, what it costs. But, you know, it, it is, I am, you know, very much inclined to, to recommend this, I, that it be constructed. I think, you know, you, you achieve something positive, you get it done, you, you, 
you save money on the appraisals, you save money on the attorneys, and wherever else this might go. So I would, you know, recommend that you do set this for public hearing, uh, so that we, we not only survey the Hayes, but we also send notice out to the other neighbors in the area, as well as to involve the third party in this, which is the Canterbury Association, because technically they're also in a butter because where the road dead ends, they, I believe, own the land at the end there, plus the, you know, as you've seen here, there's easements as well. So, uh, you know, the, the parties would like this resolved. They do understand we wouldn't do anything this winter, but they would like to, you know, know as, as they're entitled to under the, the law, you know, really what the town's going to do with this. So I would hope that you would set it for public hearing uh, to gauge other opinion on it and perhaps uh, decide the issue at your December meeting. Thank you. Councillor Reid. Um, Michael, could you ex and on that time frame, on uh, the expectation that nothing would be done until the spring, but is that the spring of 97, this could be resolved if an affirmative vote is taken next month? Every discussion I've had with the parties has been, you know, they'd like to see it done next construction season. There's, there's, you know, we haven't said an exact it has to be done, you know, with, with the seasons and those type things. They, they really want to see it done next construction season. You know, we would try to get it done. June, July, somewhere around there. Councillor Jordan. Well, I just want to ask, maybe I misunderstood it or didn't quite get it as you were speaking, is the turnaround. What is the turnaround now? We, we don't have a turnaround. The extension, the way it was laid out with the original acceptance back in 1968 or whatever year it was, it did not have a turnaround. In discussions with Mr. Malley about it, what we what we now do is back up to Kildare Road, which is the the next street. He doesn't he, he thinks that's not a good situation, but he doesn't think because there there's no possibility for additional homes being built back there. He doesn't and these homes are already there. He he isn't worried about just backing up that extra 75 to 95 feet. There's already a problem there. And, uh, you know, one thing we will look for, and we've had discussions on it, is, you know, obviously when we, when we do the work, we're going to make sure we have room for snow storage up there, so at least we're not hauling snow back out that we do find a spot to put it up in there. So there isn't room enough for a turnaround? No. Unless you go on somebody else's property? There isn't room. How did we get into this? Well, I, you know, I was 12 years old in 1960. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't asked to look into it at the time, so I think you were on the council, weren't you? <laughs> I was on the council. You asked. But I, but I think somebody built a house beyond. Now, it's the town. They had to turn around up there one time, yeah. but they didn't have to back back to kill their road. No. If we had one, it wasn't a legal one that was on the plan. Oh. But the house lot was legal, but the turnaround was. Okay. I think there should be a turnaround there. That's all I'm saying. Councilor Coxell. Yes, I'd like to request to Mr. McGovern that um, with our packets next month, if you could have a map that would depict the road as constructed now and the extension. We don't really have anything that's that clear. We have the engineer's design, but something with a lot less figures and squiggles on it. I don't know if he's, he can always enlarge that and blow it up. Verify it. Yeah, we'll do what we can. Thanks. Any further comments? Could we have a motion, please? Councilor Coxell. I move that we set for public hearing um, at our next public um, next meeting, December 11th, 1996, at 730 in the town hall. Public hearing to um, complete construction of the accepted portion of Columbus Road. Second. Further discussion? All those in favor? 6 0 with Roth abstaining. Thank you. Item number 105 is a request from the Portland Water District to amend its bylaws regarding compensation of trustees. <coughs> Mr. McGovern? Yes, we received a letter uh, the beginning of last month indicating that the Portland Water District trustees uh, want to amend their bylaws uh, and their charter in a number of uh, respects. They, they are taking action on their own to amend their bylaws, but w one item involves the charter and a charter provision uh, involving compensation of trustees of, of the Pullen Water District. Uh, currently they receive $1,200 per year 
uh, for the service as a trustee. What they're proposing is, is an amendment to the bylaws of the district, uh, whereby that trustees of the district, other than the president, would receive compensation in the amount of $100 for each regular meeting, special meeting or workshop actually attended, not to exceed $2,400 per year. The president of the district would receive $125, get more for leading, uh, for regular meeting, special meeting or workshop, uh, not to exceed $3,000 per year and they continue to be reimbursed for uh, expenses and whatever, uh, you know, if they go to conferences and meetings, that type of thing. This is a proposal from the district. They were notified uh, that you would be considering this this evening uh, when the agenda was prepared a little week ago. Thank you. Councilor McGinty. Are these the same people who give us the highest water rates in the district? A rhetorical the question. highest water yeah. rate, the highest it's sewage it's rate. Sewer. We have the highest sanitary sewage rates. That's a town problem rather than water district problem, I believe. Is that correct, Mr. McGovern? The, 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 town, town, council, policies. the town council sets the sewer rates. The water rates are, are set by virtue of a PUC decision in a rate case a couple of years ago. Uh, since that time, the comp, the comp position, I have compensation on my mind, the uh, composition of the trustees has changed so that it's more town represent, representation. There's also a, a totally different uh, group of individuals there, and I'm, I'm not taking a position on this, but uh, I would, you know, I, I have found the current trustees to be uh, very much leading the district in very positive directions and very unbiased in terms of helping cities versus towns, which is not to say how you should vote on this. Uh, that's, you know, an entirely different matter, but they, they have been really good working with over the last couple of years. Didn't the PUC, in fact, they ordered them to, to bring closer our rates closer together with the with the urban areas? 15% differential. Right. Was that, well, you, maybe you don't know, was that in <coughs> opposition to what these trustees wanted to do? These particular trustees no. The trustees who were in place in office at the time, yes, uh, except for a couple of them. Uh, you know, the, the Bridget Kingsbury, for one, who's been a, a, just a, a great representative of the town, whose term is about to be up and doesn't plan to run again, uh, is looking for replacement. Uh, so a citizen hopefully might take her place. Uh, she was with us all the way, as were a couple of other trustees who were no longer there. Do you have anything else, Councillor McGinty? Not at this time. Councillor Linnell? Um, yes, I wonder if the manager could help me with a little with the math here. I mean, this is whatever, if, if they got this uh, raise, I mean, this is shared with other communities. This isn't, wouldn't all be coming out of Cape Elizabeth. So this would be shared over with other communities. That's right. The, the trustee expenses are an allocated expense across the entire district including both wastewater and uh, sand and uh, regular water. Okay, so I thank you. I, uh, <coughs> I may be inclined to vote for this, although I'll note that uh, I voted against uh, ha having, the wa having them uh, handle our sewerage. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> I think then we're also giving them a bigger raise than we're getting if we do this. Uh, we're not getting any money. <laughs> Wouldn't take much to get a bigger raise than we're paying ourselves. Thank you. I didn't know that uh, we were supposed to compare their ra wages and our wages. Well, you don't have to. Okay. <laughs> Everything's relative, that's all. Oh. What a question. Thank uh, I'd like Councillor Reed. Put her hand up before he said that we were going to move. I, I was just going to say uh, I'll make the uh, recommendation um, for a motion if everyone's through. Certainly. Um, that I um, recommend that we approve the request of the Portland Water District to amend the bylaws regarding compensation of the trustees. Thank you. I'll second. My comment would be when I was sitting down with the um, Linda Boudreaux from South Portland and John McDonough from Portland yesterday and we talked about naming the bridge. I said, well, what have you folks done about the water district trustees? South Portland has already had this on their agenda, and they 
um, did not vote in favor of it. In Portland, John said that the water district trustees were coming in to meet with that council in a workshop to discuss it. In a correspondence we had from the water district in September, it noted that they need approval from the majority of the municipal, municipal officers of the towns served by the water district. So we're, regardless, you know, this council's vote certainly has an impact, but the final outcome may not go the way that this council votes. I just want to make sure everybody's aware of that. I'm very, I'm disappointed, quite frankly, that we don't have anybody from the water district here tonight. I see that as a slight. Could I ask for clarif Thank you. Uh, just clarification. If they, do they need uh, all communities to approve it or a, 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 a majority? A majority. A majority. I understand. Thank you. As I read this, and I may be reading it wrong, is that which, which you would end up with is for each trustee district, you have the vote within that trustee district. Okay. For example, we have a trustee district that includes Gorm and Scarborough. So in, in the case of the trustees representing our three communities, it would be the vote of those three communities. Whatever South Portland votes, okay. well, Portland wouldn't depend on it. It would be the vote of the communities in this trustee district. Thank you for that clarification. I have not had conversations with Scarborough or Gorham. Have you, Mr. McGovern? Okay. Councillor Jordan. No, I just want to say the reason I supported it is I like the idea that they're going to get paid for the number of meetings they attend. Before, I believe it was, they got it regardless whether they attended meetings or not, as I understood it from a previous trustee. They got that stipend for the year. Wait. I don't know if it says it in this document or not. But it says by I, attendance right now, because I looked at that too. I thought that was curious. And so I feel it's a fair way to do it if they get paid so much for the meetings they attend. Thank you. Councillor Reed. Um, I'd just like to know uh, if the manager knows the number of trustees that this would um, impact and also what their uh, stipend was prior to this $1,200 and $100 per meeting. The answer to both questions is no. I, I, I know they expanded the number of trustees, and I know, you know, if, if my understanding of this is correct, that you're really only voting for the trustees from Gorham, Scarborough, and uh, Cape Elizabeth. We share two trustees, uh, currently Sam Macedo, the, who is, lives in the town of Gorham, and Brigitte Kingsbury, who lives here in Cape Elizabeth. Thank you. Councilor McGinty? Does that mean that if that the trustees in the different yeah. areas could be paid differently? That doesn't make any sense. What, what the, the bylaws provide is that really they're responsive to the communities that they represent. I understand that, but... You know, what, what it does, it begins to create pressure on other other trustee districts to, uh, you know, determine whether or not, you know, yeah, it's, it's just the way it's set up. It's, it's strange. It apparently has been set up so there's quite healthy council control, which is not something we encounter very often with other entities. But in reading it over a couple of times and having discussions, as I said, with those um, South Portland and Portland reps, that was the conclusion we were coming to. It's curious that it has to be a vote of the municipal officers, not of the voters who put them into office, put them into their trustee positions. But that's the way it's written. That's the way it was set up, apparently. And I'm assuming that so the councils had the hammer. Council McGinty. I'm going to reluctantly support this because two, two reasons. A, if I'm going to take the town manager at his word that these district trustees, in fact, are s recognize the inequity that we suffer here in Cape Elizabeth with our rates. And second, I, I think that it would be unfair to have some trustees being paid at one level. And it doesn't sound right, but that I can't believe they would allow that to happen, but that some trustees would be making more or less than others in the same water district. Um, and I also believe that 
you know, people put in this time, and I'm sure, as we all know in this council, we put in a lot of time um, outside of the public eye, and um, they, they certainly deserve compensation for the work that they do do. So. Thank you. Councilor Reid. Last comment, just for the public that are listening. Um, this raise is requested since the trustees have not had an increase in their compensation since 1975. Thank you. I'd like to say Council McGinty has expressed my feelings very nicely. Thank you. Any further discussion? All those in favor? All those opposed? Six to one, Linnell opposed? Thank you. Item number 106 is a request to form a committee to study, yeah, study the former poor farm property. Councilor Coxell. All right. Um, Councilor Linnell and I have as our goal this year to shepherd through the um, a study committee to report on the use of the former poor farm property. Um, Mr. McGovern drew up a draft of the formation of this committee, and we proofread it and the results you have here tonight. Shall I read it? For the benefit of the public still know what this is about. Certainly. The introduction is, over the last decade, the town conducted an extensive review process to revol resolve the town's obligations relating to the Thomas Jordan Trust. The town subsequently purchased the former poor farm land from the Thomas Jordan Trust and now owns the land unencumbered. There have been a number of suggestions for uses of the property over the years. These including selling a portion of it to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for the Rachel Carson Preserve, placing baseballs on the property. Ball fields, excuse me. <laughs> what did I say, ball? Baseballs. Baseballs. <laughs> ball fields. Okay. I think um, construction of a mental health hospital, placing conservation restrictions on the land, selling it to private parties, and building a sewer treatment plant on the site, which has been done. The committee uh, would be created um, in the following manner. The town council hereby creates the seven-member Poor Farm Study Committee. The committee shall include two town council members appointed by the town council chairman. The Conservation Commission and the Cape Elizabeth Planning Board shall also each be asked to designate one member to serve on the committee. The remaining three members shall be appointed by the Town Council utilizing its appointments committee process. The Town Manager shall be a non-voting ex officio member of the committee, and I might add so is the Town Council Chairman uh, because of her office. Um, that's understood. We don't even need to put it in there, probably. Committee purpose and charge. The purpose of the committee is to consider the status of the poor, former poor farm property, excluding that portion that is utilized as the town refuge disposal area and the sewage treatment facility, and to make any recommendations relating to the property that the committee believes is in the best interest of the community. During its deliberations, the committee shall conduct one public forum to solicit community input and shall keep the town council and the public informed of its continuing work. The committee shall also review past correspondence with the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, the Cape Elizabeth Comprehensive Plan, the Cape Elizabeth Zoning Ordinance, and the Cape Elizabeth Visual Access Study. $1,500 for the preparation of maps and related work shall be made available for the committee's use. And the committee shall report on its conclusions to the town council no later than June 30, 1997. Thank you. We had something similar to this earlier this year. And in looking through, could you give us the comparisons with that? Do you have that? I don't have it with me, but the comparison was we had one town councilor. Mm -hmm. I believe a composition of two, two representatives from the other committee. Since you have it in front of you, maybe you could do it for me. Okay. At that time, we were looking at creating a five-member committee. And as Councilor Cogswell has stated, it was to consist of one town council member. It also stated that the Conservation Commission and the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust shall also each be asked to designate two members, <coughs> excuse me, to serve on the committee. 
the it's down now to one member from the Conservation Commission, no members specifically from the Land Trust, and one member from the Planning Board. I'm curious as to why the Land Trust representation has been replaced by, has been totally cut and then seemingly replaced by a Planning Board member. My recollection is as the Town Council discussed this at a workshop uh, not long after the last vote of the Town Council and that was the consensus of the discussion at that point. Thank you. Councillor Reid. Um, I didn't support this the first time it came up and if I do support it this time um, I would need a couple of uh, questions answered. First of all I do support the fact that it would be a seven member committee if established. Um, I support the two town council members being appointed by the town council chair but the next sentence, the Conservation Commission and the Cape Elizabeth Planning Board shall each be asked to designate one member. I think uh, after member, it should say each. It, I was doing the math here, and it looked like maybe one member could come from both of those groups. Okay. Also, I'd like to know what happens if they have no volunteers. Um, also, the three remaining members shall be appointed by the town council Utilizing its appointments committee process, um, I would like to see a representative from the land trust named in the description of the committee makeup with only two members being appointed uh, by the sort of at-large group. Um, and I would like to know in the committee purpose in charge next to the last line, the Cape Elizabeth zoning ordinance, I'd like to know, is that the existing one or the one that we are expected to adopt, including all the changes regarding the scenic overlay, the marsh views, et cetera? And then my last question is, is $1,500 um, a realistic amount in um, light of the approval of the, uh, I'm going to say GFI, but it's not, it's GIS? GIS. I have electrical circuits on my mic, and those are mine. Okay, questions. thank you. Mr. McGovern, can you address me? Unfortunately, I didn't write all the questions, but I'll, I'll try to do my best. I think, you know, for your first question is about the, the makeup of the committee and substitution, and that's a policy decision. Uh, on the question of the Cape Elizabeth zoning ordinance, which ordinance, uh, when this was drafted, it was the intent that it be the ordinance in effect at the time this was, was drafted. You know, I. I can't presuppose that the, that the ZORC recommendation is going to be adopted. So this is the, in accordance with the zoning ordinance uh, currently in effect. Uh, the $1,500, uh, we don't plan to obtain a consultant for this work. The sense is there may be a little bit of mapping, there may be some printing charge, some uh, public materials, you know, to get the issue out. And this is, uh, you know, money for the work of the committee so that staff doesn't go and say, sorry, we don't have any money to do this. Uh, it's, you know, in order to be responsive to the committee's requests. Thank I think it will be more than sufficient. Okay. okay. It just looked low, and I just want to make sure it, it was. If we, most, a lot of committees would hire consultants, and this one, you know, other than a little map work, we, we wouldn't really Thank need you. to. Thank you. Council and Nell? Yes, I'd just like to <coughs> ask if we uh, included, <coughs> excuse me, a member of the land trust, if the land trust folks think they could muster someone, if, if it would be a burden, or if they, th if they think they could find someone. <laughs> I think the answer is in a heartbeat. <laughs> <laughs> Probably find seven. <laughs> I've heard from the land trust. <laughs> okay. Councilor right. Jordan. You finish? Well, I just, I guess I'd be inclined to, to, uh, have one of the uh, substitute one of the at large spots with somebody from the land trust wouldn't bother me any. Thank you, Councilor Jordan. I I feel that land tr there should be a land trust representative on this committee, and also I feel it's too heavy as far as the council goes. You get two members and you get the chairman. You got three. Unless the chairman's going to sit there and not say anything and come up with no ideas and all this and that. So I think that gives you three members. And I think we're look, I'm looking for some outside input as far as this goes. So you'd like to see it 
remain at seven members but have only one town councillor in the addition chair, to the if chairman. If the chair is going to represent the council there, I think one member in the chair. If the chair is just going to, well, I don't want to put it in <laughs> my type of language. <laughs> the out of character. <laughs> yes. I think it gives them three. I under, I three out of the four. Thank you. Further discussion, Council Nell. Well, the, the chair is appointing uh, the two from the council, but the, the chair, as I understand, the chair of the council isn't part of the committee. It's, there'd be, there would be two councillors serving on the committee. The chair is an ex officio member of all committees. All committees. Oh, right. This also happens to be a committee the chair is quite interested in, so I doubt that she would sit there out of character. Council McGinty. Um, I, I don't think there's any intent to, uh, to leave out the land trust, but I'm wondering if maybe we might ask that, see if the Conservation Commission and the land trust could get together and designate one. Remember, I think the biggest concern we have is a balance, and we don't want to balance it one way, <coughs> I mean, have it an imbalance one way or the other. And I know that they have different missions, but, um, I would be open to having the, the Conservation Commission and the Land Trust get together and select somebody, one person, okay. at their discretion. Councilor Groff? That really doesn't resolve the balance. I mean, the way this is set up through the Appointments Committee process, uh, there's three members appointed there. So the balance of this committee is really going to be determined uh, in large part by the appointments committee process. And I think, uh, since I'm on the appointments committee, I mean, that's fine with me. But if I wasn't, I would rant, because I'm sure I'll make sure it's balanced. But if I wasn't on the appointments committee process, I think I would want to see uh, a land trust person on and, uh, uh, and reduce that uh, ability of the appointments committee to uh, uh, stack the committee any way they want. And I think it's a prudent change to allow a land trust person to be on and uh, uh, at the same time keep the rest of the committee as it is. All we're really talking about is, by putting a land trust person on, is reducing the appointments committee's discretion from the point three to two. Uh, and I can tell you candidly that, uh, uh, from my point of view, that if we don't have the land trust listed, one of the people that I would certainly make sure from my input on the appointments committee would be a land trust person anyway. So I think we're probably making a big to-do about nothing because um, one way or the other, if we want to balance, the land trust person is going to be on. We might as well set it forth and let, and let everybody know from the get-go that that's how it's going to